You are listening to the Midweek Redemption Podcast, a resource from Redemption City Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. For more information about our church, please visit our website at redemptiongr.org. Church family, Happy New Year. It's Josh. Uh, great to be with you today. I hope you had a, a good New Year celebration. I hope you had a good time saying goodbye to 2020. Good riddance. Uh, Lord, may 2021 be better than last year. Uh, at the time of this posting, I will be uh, doing a little silence and solitude retreat uh, myself. Camille asked me what I wanted for my birthday, and that's what I told her. So she's hanging with my folks. Uh, down in Columbus and uh, so they can help with the kiddos and I'm sneaking away to a little retreat house uh, north of Columbus for a couple nights Uh, so I'm excited about that also a little intimidated just because you know when you turn all the noise and distraction off sometimes it can be intense but um, yeah excited to get get away a little bit and so uh, because of that and just kind of all the travel and crazy and basement remodeling I am uh Today I'm going to post a, uh, a kind of an edited teaching from uh, my last church, uh, a teaching that I gave at my last church up in Big Rapids, uh, kind of similar topics of our theory of transformation and kind of moves the ball forward with some other uh, other ideas to chew on as we consider uh, just where we are in the life of the church, and, um, and it, it looks at uh, Hebrews 12 and a couple other uh, pretty cool passages. So I hope it's a, a blessing to you, and I'm excited to uh, be back with you uh, all together either (laughs) literally or uh, virtually. Uh, God bless. We're looking at Hebrews 12, looking at practices uh, of Jesus and how they help us become like him. So uh, as far as as far as I've heard in in my pursuit of understanding more about the history of our church is that there was a there was a period, there's a point in time when at this at this church at First Baptist Church, uh, there was a there was a list of rules that was kind of attached inside uh, inside the hymnals, uh, and anyone could read it, and on regular intervals, the, the church would read through the rules um, together, and they, uh, as from what I've heard, they were the classic Baptist rules of, you know, no drinking, or playing cards, or going to movies, or, uh, you know, smoking, or, and I, there, I feel like I've heard at some point there's some kind of, like, someone wouldn't come to church because they didn't have time to go home and get a dress, or something like that, and so, the, you know, those, those kind of, like, classic mid-century Baptist rules, um, I don't know how that makes you feel, but it makes me a little, little squirmy. And, and part of that is because, by contrast, my church experience growing up um, in, a, in a different Baptist church in the 80s and 90s was, was kind of phrased by, framed by the phrase, Christianity isn't about rules, it's about relationships. Man, most of the time, <laughs> dude, man, bro, followed that. And it was kind of like a, a direct direct response to that that list of rules and, and of course it's true like the you know jesus god with us jesus is emmanuel uh, to have a, a way to for us to be with god uh through the cross uh but in my experience it, it didn't seem to like be super fruitful uh, and so to start i just want to do a, a super brief like mini uh church history lesson through just kind of like the last i don't know 60 70 years kind of basically <laughs> since world war ii and consider like how, where, where where we are now and how, how we got here uh, the first kind of movement of of that period is uh, the 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 rule list, uh, behavior modification. Being a Christian is about not doing some things and doing certain other things. Uh, and it, like for example, and this is like a vestige of that. And in, in in our church, when I got here four years ago, uh, nobody would touch alcohol, uh, but we had like three or four people that had like bariatric surgery. Like we we won't drink, but we can do some damage at a potluck. Uh, so it was like it was a focus on rules, on certain rules, uh, but but not 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 the the wholeness of life. Other churches that I've heard, you know, had had the rule of like makeup was bad, or watching Disney movies was bad, or something like that. You know, you kind of have these different different rules. And, and but the, just the fact of human nature is you, you can't make a rule about everything, and so inevitably there, there are going to be blind spots and you know hypocrisy and stuff. Uh, and then, uh, kind of out of that, into the 80s and 90s, uh, you had the birth of the megachurch, uh, where a lot of the, the the focus now became on relevance, uh, adopting kind of business practices or marketing practices, 
uh, to, to, to grow the church and, uh, and, and to grow the church specifically by treating members as uh, consumers uh, uh, and, and then try to produce a product or an experience that, that then members could kind of come and, uh, and, and enjoy. Uh, and, and, of course, no consumer wants limits, right? Like, the customer is always right. And so out of the 80s and 90s, you kind of had my experience, which is like, it's not, it's not about rules. It's about a relationship, uh, which on a very important level is true, of course. Our standing with God is based on knowing Jesus as Lord and Savior, what he's done for us by grace, through faith. But it had kind of been, uh, in that time, I believe, kind of reduced to just like your own personal relationship with Jesus. Uh, there was like a satirical song by Nine Inch Nails, this very blasphemous band about like my own personal Jesus. Uh, and then Johnny Cash covered it and like totally redeemed it. But that's, a, that's another sermon uh, where it was just uh, whatever, whatever uh, you know, is right for you and Jesus, just your own personal walk with, with, with him. And so the church then just kind of hoped to be this Non non-committal place to just help you in in Jesus uh, if it was helpful you know that's where like a lot of the focus like do I get fed uh, and, and you know and, and obviously you need to get fed but you know the, the over focus of just me and Jesus is this helping helping my individual experience and and in my experience for most of my peers that rules not a relationship not rules uh, basically meant that like uh, my faith just didn't really require require much. I didn't need to put out much of an effort because it's just a, it's a relationship. It's all about grace. It didn't mean I needed to do much. And like the translation was basically, uh, as in a youth group setting, was just uh, kind of hang out, do icebreakers, go to different retreats and zip lines and stuff like that. Uh, it, it was it was almost, and this might just have been my experience or my own particular bent. It was like it became cool to not care or not to put out any effort and in the Christian life. And, you know, I don't think my pastor said that. It was just kind of the air we, we breathed. We wanted to be relevant. You know, we weren't like teetotalers or, or you know, about movies and music and stuff like that. And, of course, that's just not going to cut it. And, uh, and, again, speaking in broad sp- broad strokes, you saw this really beautiful movement in kind of the first decade of the 21st century uh, where, where this it was just this, like, life-changing return to doctrine and orthodoxy and deep theology, uh, which to my, like, casual, cool, youth groupy self, uh, kind of blew my mind. There was this moment uh, in college where my mentor sat down with me and so deeply and beautifully unpacked First Timothy 1 that I was like never the same. I was like, whoa, this is like a whole way of reading the Bible, studying the Bible. It was just like, whoa. And, uh, and, and generally this, this, uh, this movement focused on uh, the doctrine of atonement or justification, uh, diving into the beautiful depths of what Jesus has done for us, um, and it, it kind of championed this term gospel-centered. Uh, and so for another decade, it seemed like the gospel-centered movement, or is also called neo-Calvinism, there's a huge article in Time magazine, um, a 2009-ish, you know, that, that, that talked about this, like, re- return to doctrine and a strong, sovereign, powerful God. And, you know, and of course, like, Time magazine is so baffled by this. Like, I thought we, I thought we were done with that. And, um, and, and, that, and then that kind of brings us today. What, what's next? Um, or maybe uh, to make it more personal, like how has the, the gospel-centered, deep theological life worked out for us? Um, and that, that might be a little bit of a squirmy question. Uh, you might be thinking, well, hey, the gospel is not the ABCs of Christianity, it's the A to Z of Christianity. Uh, yes and amen. Uh, but if the gospel only means, when we say gospel-centered, if we only mean justification, if we only mean a justification by grace alone, then I want us to consider um, if that if that is true. Because uh, in my my experience, I was planning a church during the neo Calvinist era, uh, if you can call it that. Uh, I was helping a guy plant a church. Uh, While well, that gospel center movie it was such a gift and so deeply grounding, and penal substitutionary atonement is just like a pillar and bastion of, of our faith we can never let go of. Um, I experienced some of the similar hypocrisies within that as the fundamentalists that, you know, don't drink but, you know, need their stomachs removed uh, or whatever. It was 2011. We were planning a church, and we were all about the gospel. It was Jesus on the bloody cross every single day. But then me and the, the other leader, we were overweight. We were anxious. We couldn't sleep. I was really struggling with pornography and depression. I mean, we were like staunch sovereignty of God guys who couldn't trust the sovereignty of God enough to like sleep sleep at night. 
I had I I could write papers about the the fact of the comfort of the gospel, but I still was going to pornography for for comfort. What was up with that? Well, I got a, a new job at a church in Louisville um, called Sojourn, and one of the requirements at that church for staff was uh, uh, that we take one day a month, a work day, one day a month to practice silence and solitude. I mean, I had never really heard of that term, and my boss was like, okay, here's what you do. You find a comfortable spot, and then you sit there. And I'm like, okay, then what? He was like, at this point, like, I'm newly married, like, full-time in seminary, working full-time at the church, like, you know, I, I had a very high RPM rate, uh, rate all the time. And he's like, that's it. Get comfortable. Sit there. Ask God to search you and know you and try your anxious heart and lead you into the way everlasting and see what happens. And so I tried. And let me tell you, I almost went crazy. It was like stomping around the house, like, so restless and, like, this raging raging monkey mind that I, like eventually just for like I just couldn't handle it and I just like checked out and started like reading Chronicles of Narnia just to like to distract myself from like the tornado within and that was just kind of the first shot across the bow that something needed to change like it was a question I had trouble answering what, what did it mean that when I finally slowed down stopped doing ministry and seminary and everything else and just tried to actually be with God uh, that I went crazy doctrine, knowing the facts of the atonement, working in ministry, all that stuff was not enough. And it launched me into this huge journey of seeking the life that is truly life, the fullness of life that Jesus came to give us, the well of living water springing up out of us, the abiding in Jesus' love. And it turns out that there there is a couple millennia of, of content from other Jesus followers out there who have sought to do that exact thing in like real, normal human life, like the daily minutes of our existence. <laughs> So as we continue our teaching series on how to become like Jesus, uh, the, the how is super important. Typically, I think the church focuses on the what and the why. What does the Bible call us to believe and the why? But the Great Commission has this sneaky little phrase in it that, that I've been guilty of overlooking. We actually go through our membership class this past month uh, when I copied and pasted the Great Commission into it. I left this line out in our membership book, so we need a third edition of that. But Matthew 28 says this, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. What we see here is that Jesus intended the church, the community of his disciples, to be a place where where people uh, are invited to be disciples and followed him or baptized into the triune presence uh, and then are taught how to obey. And one of the tricky things about that is that most of Jesus' commands are not things that we can do by direct effort. You know, like if Jesus said, and do 10 push-ups every day before bed, like some of us might have to work up to that, but we could actually do that by, you know, by direct effort. But instead he says things like, the greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Like, none of us can do that by direct effort, by just trying to. Or he says, hey, don't worry about your life. Oh, thanks, Jesus, I never thought about that. Like, I, uh, now I'll just stop it. it. It doesn't work like that. We don't kill our anxiety by just uh, trying. Instead, it's like his commands are, are, like, become the kind of person who loves God above everything else. Become the kind of person for whom it's more natural to be at peace and to trust God as a good father than it is to be up all night with a monkey mind. What I'm talking about is being transformed into the image of Christ, to have our our whole being become so like Christ over time that it's like second nature to do what Jesus did, to respond to things the way Jesus did. As we move through our chart that's there in your bulletin, the one with the triangle, it's kind of a working theory of how we become like Jesus. Uh, today we're looking at practices again, uh, down there at the bottom left uh, part, uh, and we're looking at Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, there's actually three practices, uh, but um, we're only going to look at one today, uh, just for the sake of uh, time and to do justice to all of them. Uh, the main, and here's the main focus uh, for today. The main focus for today is that focus forms us. What you focus on is going to shape the kind of person uh, that you become. 
And as we uh, go through uh, this passage, uh, I want to want to make a distinction. Uh, there's two parts uh, that that we're looking at today. There is the what, and there is the how. The what is the the principle, um, and then the how is the the ways we live out that principle. And and what we'll see is that the principle or the what that the the text is talking about is not optional. It's a command. We don't get to pick. You can kind of think of it like the mandatory uh, mandatory command to renovate your heart. Renovate the house of your soul. The hows, however, are not commands. The hows are like the, the tool shed that we can use uh, to, to do the command. They're tools that will enable us to work on the renovation project of our souls. Scripture, the life of Jesus... 2,000 years of church history has given us, as Jesus followers, a huge tool shed of, of things that we can use, that we can uh, join God uh, in his renovation uh, of our heart. So let's dive in. <coughs> Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us let us fix our eyes on jesus the author and perfecter of our faith who for the joy set before him endured the cross scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of god consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart the first thing i want to point out about this passage is all the imperatives all these really intense uh verbs that are that are here these action verbs there's throw off run fix your eyes consider here's one of the founding truths that we see we see throughout scripture regarding becoming like jesus uh, is that uh without god we cannot become like jesus we cannot be sanctified but without us he won't Without God, we can't be conformed or transformed into the image of Christ. It is an act of God through the Holy Spirit uh, to complete the work that he began in us. <laughs> but as the passage we just read says, like we are not passive in it. There's all these commands. We have a mandatory part to play. And this passage perfectly weaves the, these ideas uh, together. We, we fix our eyes on Jesus. We throw off stuff that would keep us from fixing our eyes on Jesus. We run with endurance. We fix our eyes on Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. You see just that beautiful blend there? Like we do the fixing of our eyes, but Jesus is the creator, the author, the, the origin of our faith. And he's the completer of our faith. Jesus will complete our faith, but we have a part to play, to fix our eyes on him. Do you see that cooperative project in our, our soul renovation project? The what uh, we see in this passage is, is that idea of fix, of focus. We're throwing off things that are distracting, and we're fixing our eyes on Jesus. That's the principle. That's the command. We're called to throw off every weight and sin, every distraction. We're, we're called to uh, consider Jesus and what he went through. Let his life and his story and his example be big in our eyes and minds. In the Greek, the word that's translated here, fix, has this really intense, like determined, disciplined, decided, intentional focus. Fix your eyes. Don't look away. I think this is huge for us in our day and age. Uh, if this was necessary back then, I think it's even more so now, because uh, I think we very much live in an age of distraction. Uh, a poet named Mary Oliver says it like this, attention is the beginning of devotion. Or to say, to say it another way, focus is the beginning of worship. Focus is the beginning of worship. We can't love or adore, worship, or be devoted to anything that doesn't occupy our attention, and we we behold it. You'll laugh at this, but a couple of years ago, I felt uh, God calling me to get into baseball. I was looking for ways to like recreate and like slow down, and things that would chill me out and unplug from all doing and scheming and everything. And baseball's slow. It's America's pastime. It's all about running home. And it's like, oh, let's let's give that a shot. But I knew nothing about baseball. Hadn't watched a game in decades, and didn't much care. 
But I got MLB TV, which gave me access to like all the baseball games every day. I uh, read articles about my team. I just like fell in love with like the folksy wisdom of my team's manager. He's this old guy and just like just such a, a sweet, steady man. Uh, and, and after doing that, I can say I really enjoy baseball. It's because I devoted attention to it. Like it filled my mind and I understood, uh, understood it more. What we fill our minds with is going gonna, is gonna to direct our, our hearts. Scripture's full of this idea. Paul says uh, that we renew, we're, uh, we're to be transformed by the renewing of our minds in Romans 12. Or he says in Philippians 4, he says, Whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, honorable, and praiseworthy, think about these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Or, or the psalmist says in Psalm 16:8, I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. We become what we behold. It's how God made us on a biological level. Neuroscience is just catching up with this this command to fix our eyes because neuroscience shows us that we have these things called mimicry neurons in in our brains. There's like parts of our brains that by design are meant to help us, enable us to mimic the people we see. That's why kids can have the same mannerisms that, uh, that that they see in their parents. So how could we hope to become like Jesus if we only behold him for a little bit on Sunday morning or we, you know, drive by, you know, devotional, one page devotional in the morning on to, you know, bigger and better things? How could we hope to become like Jesus if we we have all these, uh, have all these things that, that hinder us or sin that entangles us and our minds are on things not Jesus the majority of the time? I've been reading about the attention economy uh, this is this growing reality, I guess, in our world where our economy is like fueled by you, your attention and my attention. Like apps and TV shows and social media are, are less and less trying to sell you something and more and more trying to sell your attention and your data to, to other companies. What, why, why I say that is because if you are not fighting to put your attention on what is most important to you, then you are probably the only one not fighting for your attention. Because your phone, other companies, advertisers, other people, your job, your boss, your friends, your kids, all these people are going to be fighting for your attention. Dallas Willard, who's written extensively on how to become like Jesus, says it like this. The first and most basic thing we can and must do is to keep God before our minds, to direct and redirect our minds constantly to him. In the early time of our practicing, note that word, we may well be challenged by our burdensome habits of dwelling on things less than God. But these are habits, not the law of gravity, and can be broken. A new grace-filled habit can be developed. If God is the great longing of our souls, he will become the pole star of our inward beings. That brings us to the to the how of focus. Dow, old, old Pastor Dallas is, is giving us this image of a compass, how the needle just can't not point north, can't not point north, and the desire is that Jesus is our true north. And that's the third point. Practices are how we focus on Jesus. Practices are how we fix our eyes on Jesus. It's like a clear plan, like they're clear, tried and true ways of habits that we can take on to, to do this. The idea is that as we take on these practices, it trains our hearts and minds to where they just naturally flow that way. There's naturally pointing to Jesus. It becomes so deeply ingrained in us that, that we, we just turn our eyes to Jesus with everything. The main one, the main practice here, is immersing ourselves in Scripture, primarily the Gospels. Notice I didn't say read the Bible on purpose because of course you, while of course you read to immerse yourself, immersing ourselves is so much more than just reading. It means making the story of scripture the dominant story that we're living out of. Uh, The the first practice uh, of immersion in scripture is meditation. And uh, I'm just like repeating, you know, what every old pastor that mentors me tells me is, is like get people meditating on the word. Like that is like ground zero for for everything. Meditating on small portions of scripture. And to be honest, in a lot of ways, uh, I, the way I've experienced this, this can be even harder than reading 
reading a huge chunk of scripture. There's a lot of value in reading huge chunks of scripture, and we should definitely complement <clears throat> meditation with that. But I, it, just in my own experience, I'm doing a, a meditative reading plan uh, through the Gospel of Mark with the, the college group Camille and I are leading, and it could be like super hard to like bring bring focus and attention to just four or five verses, you know, for like twenty or or thirty minutes. Read them several times slowly, and then just sit quietly and listen listen to the Spirit and what He wants us to know, uh, and consider deeply Him uh, Him who came before us, the Author and Perfecter of our faith. Why did Jesus do what He did? What does that mean for me as I follow him? We don't have to answer these questions uh, on our own. We just simply put him before our minds. We fix our eyes on him. And and honestly, there are times where I read the little passage for the day and I just want to like blaze through. Like you can read, you can read the gospel of Mark in like 45 minutes or something. But typically the reason why I want to blaze through is because my focuser is tired. The second, we'll talk about that in a minute. The second one is scripture memory. I really am like kind of sporadic with this. Like there'll be like months where I'm like really into scripture memory, and then I just kind of get out of the habit or whatever. Uh, so I'm still working on being consistent with this. Uh, but th- those months where I am consistently memorizing scripture is like such a joy uh, because it, it I find myself praying it and speaking it and waking up with it on my mind. Um, Dallas Willard says that memorizing scripture is like the process of like getting scripture in us you know like when the psalmist says I've hidden your word in my heart like that's not just a poetic metaphor like there's there's ways that we can actually do that like it dwells in us it it hides there making making habits uh, to do these things to to meditate uh, well and deeply uh, on scripture and to memorize scripture uh, it requires lots of focus, and, and probably, if you're like me, we'll find you will need to make other changes in your habits to, in order to uh, be able to to do that. Like if you uh, wanted to develop the habit of running, to run a marathon or whatever, you're probably not going to like be able to eat a whole pizza every night. Like you might have to like you know align your habits to the same goal. Uh, and it's the same with our focuser. Our focusers can be really, really uh, atrophied and weak uh, because nothing in our lives typically naturally train us to focus. Uh, for a long time like if we're used to scrolling through Instagram and having like beautiful stimulating pictures and videos you know flashing before our eyes it's going to be a rude awakening to sit quietly before six verses for you know for 30 minutes and read them slowly and then just and then just wait Uh, that's going to be super hard so I'm not saying it's easy or you're going to try it this afternoon and just you know tongues of fire will fall down or whatever uh, well, I'm saying if Jesus uh, and becoming like him is something you want, then it's going to require uh, a robust effort. Uh, we're not earning anything. Uh, this is all a gift. Uh, it's going to require robust effort to fix our eyes on him. And with great resolve, resist distractions and cut them out. Uh, the, the, next, uh, the next practice that we didn't get to uh, is uh, basically fighting sin. Uh, and the psalmist goes to shedding blood. He's like, you haven't resisted sin to the point, or the Hebrews author says you haven't resisted sin to the point of shedding blood um so look forward to that one when we get to it uh but this is how we we make space for the holy spirit to make us like jesus how we behold who he is and to close i just want us to soak in a couple beautiful passages uh that talk about this uh in in others authors languages or language the first one is first john three would you turn there with me i just want to read these and Make a, a couple of simple comments, and then and then we'll be done. First John three, verse two through three, nineteen hundred in the Pew Bible. Actually, let's start. First John three, verse one. How great is the love of the Father! The the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that he did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he, Jesus, appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. 
Do you see the beauty of this of this capture of the gospel? Like we now are children of God, but just like when a baby's born, there's a lot more that the parents desire for them to just stay an adorable eight pound baby or, or whatever. But instead, there's this vision of wholeness, of growing into maturity, and we will be like him when we see him as he is. So we can see him as he is in scripture, uh, in part, in, in the power of the spirit, but there will be a day we'll be fully like him because we'll behold him face to face. The next passage to chew on, uh, to, to end with, is 2 Corinthians 3, uh, 17. Page 17, 97 in the Pew Bible. Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we, who with unveiled faces... Behold, the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord. Because of the incredible grace of God, uh, forgiving us of our sins, washing us clean, and putting a new heart in him, we now have unveiled faces to behold behold our King and Savior. And then, then as we behold him, we're being transformed into his likeness, ever-increasing glory and incremental degrees of glory. And this is the good news. This is our hope. Uh, let us, uh, let's cling to it uh, in the grace of the gospel and fix our eyes on our King. Let me pray. Mm-hmm.